the way that the world would accept. Uh, well, everybody is, from my point of view, sometimes a little bit of an opportunist, so that's, for me, that, 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 that's okay. But nevertheless, he was aware of the fact that his, his topological proofs were not acceptable, strictly speaking, from his own point of view. And then when he had become famous, he had a perfect relation with Hilbert in Göttingen. And Hilbert was the, 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 the king of, of mathematics at the time. After the death of Poincaré, it was Hilbert who was the king. Uh, sitting in his, on his throne in Göttingen in Germany. Uh, and Brouwer became editor of the Mathematische Annale. That was the, the, the journal for mathematics, uh, uh, which was led by Hilbert. Uh, and then, after the First World War, Brouwer started to publish about constructivist mathematics. And it slowly became clear that it would be very hard to get certain classical results, and that they probably would have to be rejected. Well, that was still okay. But then, other mathematicians, like Hermann Weyl, for example, uh, started saying that they liked Brouwer's ideas, and Hilbert considered uh, Brouwer at a certain moment as a danger for traditional classical mathematics. There was this revolutionary, it's actually called the revolution in some texts. There was this revolutionary, well, the, 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 the Russian revolution lay just behind them, you know, the, whole, the, the, the Russian empire was taken over by the communists, and there was this mathematical communist with his extreme ideas going to finish a considerable part of traditional mathematics. And that is why Hilbert decided that Brouwer had to be removed from the uh, editorial board of the Mathematische Annale. And Einstein was also on the board. Cara Theodori was on the board. Einstein was a bit neutral. He, he thought that Hilbert was exaggerating, but, but he did not really object. That was dramatic for, uh, for, for Brouwer. That's, that's that part of the story. But I think, uh, I've, yeah, the, the, this was the last question, wasn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. I guess not. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. You guys have to. Uh, so, fresh morning started with some fresh topics as you are going through. And uh, now, the next topic, next talk on the subject space and uh, logic in the domain of spirituality. And uh, for that, I want to invite on stage Professor Sandeep Kumar, Departing, Department of Mechanical Engineering, IIT Varanasi. Please put your hands together and uh, welcome him on the stage. And before he starts, I want to give a small introduction about him. Professor Sandeep Kumar is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, IIT Varanasi. Received Bachelor degree from MNREC Allahabad, Masters from IT BHU and PhD from IIT Delhi. His field of interest in computational mechanics, particularly finite element method and wavelets. At present, he is working on wave propagation. He has published papers in international journal in the areas of composite plates and shells, nonlinear dynamics and chaos, uh, element free, Galakian method and uh, avection, dispersion equations, etc. He is uh, now working and has already completed various government funded projects. So put your hands together and uh, again I want to welcome your Professor Sandeep Kumar. Thank you so much and enjoy. Thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. Normally, we eat something very good at the end, but here all the good lectures are we are hearing in the beginning. I'll try to make it interesting. Normally, I'm a very boring person. Uh, my topic is space and logic in the domain of spirituality. Uh, space, 
I've been to space in a mathematical definitions. So, if you see the science, uh, we all want in science to improve the quality of human life, but we are not always progressing in the positive direction. And uh, religions is also used for the peace and to bring peace and cheers in the mind of people, but it often fails. So, instead of combining both uh, science and spirituality to bring something good, I am presenting this uh, analysis of mathematics to understand the logics, logic of Upanishad and show the deeper logic of the ancient Indian scriptures. There are two methods uh, to understand science. One is mathematics and other is experiment. We, and we both use it rigorously. So we have seen that there are many issues which cannot be resolved by experiment. We use good mathematics. So we have to understand systematically what is logic, particularly in the mathematics. And we'll see how the deep logic or Indian, uh, uh, deep rooted Indian logic and compare it with the mathematics. So first, uh, we have to define the logic. Logic normally we use to manipulate for the personal need. We tell the logic for the, our personal needs. That is not a scientific logic. I want this, so I will try to justify it. This is the normal process. But here, uh, this definition, like logic is a set of statement which consists of rules and accepted observation for new finding. Means, for, and the rule I define, rule is a simple statement based on generalization of observation and often supported by logic, which should not be violated. This is how I, we define. For example, when you play chess, there are rules that this piece will move in this way, a rook will move in this straight way or straight or like that. So this is a rule. And the objective of your playing chess is to defeat the opponent. So you give your logics. Okay, that's the difference between logic and rules. <clears throat> Rule is a simple statement, logic is a set of statements. And mathematics is the best form of rules, yeah. like theorems, proposition, and logic, the proof. So I took this quote from Russell, Mathematics possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty. So I just change it. I say that Tark me hi satya hai, satya hi sundar hai. So when I say this Tark me hi satya means the logic, truth lies in the logic. Truth lies in the logic. And truth is beautiful. Okay. Sati Sundar, everybody knows, so I just added something in the morning. Uh, let us say how mathematics developed. Probably, which I imagine, uh, people try to generalize the concept. They observe, say, one banana, one flower, one bird, and they symbolically represent something like this. And then they Symbolically started representing two. So it is uh, symbolic language. They are developing symbolic language, which we call mathematics, and is useful for quantifying ability of human mind. The mathematics initially helps in quantifying. You know, the, we have some quantifying ability, which probably other animals or other people do not have, uh, uh, species do not have, and we try to de uh, we develop this. Now. <laughs> They try to extend this concept, you know. This is what I feel, you know. They extend, try to, when there's a positive numbers and negative numbers, the decimal systems and operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, square, square root. And this all can be very easily proved by experimental means. You can take some small, uh, simple examples and you can prove it. But the square root of negative numbers, you cannot prove in a simple way. There's no simple 
So perhaps this is the first example which could not be easily verified in the visible world. Other things you can, operators you can verify, but not this. But we are forced to accept it as we do not have any doubt on this logic. Because this is logically correct, so we accepted it. It's not that we, it could be verified, so we accepted it. So probably this is the first example where the experimental proof was not existing, but we accepted it because it is logically correct. So in mathematics, often we use axioms. We accept something. And with axioms, we try to generalize the things. For example, we can measure three-dimensional space. But suppose you want to measure higher dimensional space. You cannot construct a scale. Uh, you cannot construct. So people use the axioms. And that with the help of axioms, they are able to measure the higher dimension also. It's not limited to three dimension. And three dimensional becomes a very simple case of this. So axioms are used for higher dimension, not you know, which we cannot do in the normal. So they started using some symbols and some axioms, and they define the norm, which we call norm. Similarly, they develop some symbols, define the inner product, and that is how they define the angles. Okay. Then they define the limits, Cauchy uh, sequence, and then complete space. That means that every sequence converges to a point. Then the complete space, they define the Banach space and the Hilbert space. This is how they do it. Means they are, what they are doing is, they are starting with the axioms. And because axiom doesn't have any limit, of dimension, so they can extend to any dimension. Now, the three-dimensional Euclidean space then becomes a very simple case of infinite dim dimension, Hilbert space. Now, there is another in interesting thing of this space concept. Normally, we been, when we want to give some logic the logic should be continuous. For example, when a judge hears some statements, so he observes or notices which statements are continuous. You know? And then on that basis, he decides that this person is correct. For example, uh, let us say some murder occurs and then uh, they hear the culprit they find that this culprit has the weapon, they get the weapons, then they see the motive, and then they decide that this person is a, a culprit. So they hear the logic and they see the continuity of the things. So in mathematics also, we see the continuity. Mathematics we accept because of the continuity. Mathematics we accept because it gives the continuity of logic. If there is a break in the continuity, mathematics doesn't accept that. For example, when the Fourier initially gave his concept of sine cosine series, the mathematicians could not accept it because they were not able to see the continuity. They said, what is this? You know, they said they, they were seeing some, there is some breaking of concepts. So the continuity is very important. So normally, we work in C3 or C2, space means the function is m means derivative the order of derivative so cm means the function can be differentiated m times this is all you know? so when we use this any equation we want to solve normally we see that the function is continuous or not in this but there are many problems where we find that function is not continuous. We cannot give the continuous function for the solution. So the Hilbert space, later they developed more generalized form that is called Sobolev space. They could uh, develop and that is they that gives the weak continuity. 
And to understand the concept of weak continuity, you have to understand a little bit about the measure theory also, which is a generalization of what can be measured and all. So the whole concept is little complex. You have to do a little exercise. But what I want to say that it is starting from axioms, creating the space, providing some kind of continuity. And in that continuity, we want to prove something because logic becomes continuous. So, so Hilbert space provides many things like basis function, you know, IJK is also example, provides the nece uh, necessary continuity and is, it provides the limit you know, the, where the result will converge after if you put some effort, then slowly you will get some converging point. Now this is a very simple example often we use in mechanical engineer. This problem is a little complex and uh, so we have to break this. You know, mathematicians could not conceive the concept of breaking you know, or splitting this uh, domain into pieces because they need the continuity. But the engineers have to solve the problem. So they divide, subdivided this space and they could got the answer. But later on, mathematicians proved that even though they are subdividing this domain, but in fact, there is a continuity in the subdivision. So the continuity is very important. You know? And the mathematician pro could prove it. Even engineers could do it by trial and error. Mathematician could prove that they know this, the logic is continuous. So this example of finite element method, where we, they div uh, subdivide it and and they get the algebraic equation, etc. <clears throat> so, the important point is that the mathematics validity of logic does not depend on our observation ability. We observe it, or we do not observe it, it doesn't matter. As long as it is logical and it is continuous, it is accepted. That's all. Mathematics start in the real visible world, there's no doubt. First we see, then we try to go for higher. Then axioms, we use the for higher dimension and we use the continuity. You know, this is what again I have written the CK continuity you know, initially and then we Hilbert space etc. There's another interesting thing is that initially we drive the concept using Newton's law. The problem becomes more complex than we use the energy principle. And when you take more complex problem, use the distribution theory, use the Sobolov spaces, there is no energy concept. The energy concept becomes a very special case of distribution theory. Okay. So you are starting from the bottom, but actually you are seeing something else. You are generalizing it. So the energy principle, you cannot be applied in a very complex problem. Okay, you have to use much more. Uh, and this distribution uh, concept, if you see, you cannot physically demonstrate it. You get the solution, that's all. There are many things which cannot be demonstrated physically. But when you take their simple cases, the very complex cases you cannot demonstrate physically, but you take very simple cases, there you can do it, some demonstration. So, for, but unfortunately for many scientists, logic is meaningful as long as it provides something for experiment. And we see that as the quality of equipment improves, the understanding of physical phenomena improves, and so the technology also improves. So normally, this is what happens. Normally we see that the science is progressing, is doing great job, but in fact, it is adding a lot of problems also. The important fact is that only those things can be observed or experimentally verified, which can be perceived by senses or its supporting instruments. So is it correct to believe that the true knowledge is one which can be perceived by senses or its supporting instrument? This is not correct. Therefore, logic is not only important for understanding what we observe, but also for understanding what we cannot observe. So
So, now everything depends on the logic, you know, there are many things which we cannot demonstrate it using some experiment. Now, I am studying the question, you know, is, this question is what I was before my de uh, birth and what will happen after death. I will say this is a trivial question, for many math scientists this is a trivial question. Uh, we should not think about all these things. But in fact, the whole society is governed by this question. Okay. For example, in India, one tries to convert the other in his own religion because he thinks that by converting this way, he will become heaven. The other try to kill the others because they belong to other religion. And in India, they have many become monks. And they, they are intellectual class, class. And they are affecting this whole society. So whole society is disturbed by jihadis, by this kind of conversion, by these monks. The whole society is disturbed. So let us think whether this question is really useful or not. So first, again, I take these axioms. Nothing is illogical in this world. Nothing is, I start with this statement, nothing is illogical in this world. So, if I see that there's nothing was existing before my birth and nothing will happen after death, then probably my life becomes a meaningless. Okay, then why should I live? I should commit suicide. Why should I live for 50, 60 or 100 years? Uh, just for period, enjoying some few years, 50, 60 years, uh, 70 years. So this cannot be the purpose of living. Now if I say that if I do good karmas and I get the good birth, uh, heaven, that can also be not a good answer. Because why the God selects some people give good birth, they do good things, and others, they are deprived. So this is also not a good answer to me. So what I find logically, and according to Indian philosophy, birth and death are continuous process, and we are eternal souls, always existing. It's written in Bhagavad Gita. Birth is a result of past karmas, which we perform to find the happiness here and there. Eternal happiness lies in the perfect knowledge and perfect <coughs> action. Death, which we see as a discontinuity, is a part of continuous process. According to Upanishad, we are Brahman and Brahmasmi. Sannyasis or monks use it as an axiom and form their space for all logic. So for Sannyasis, Aham Brahmasmi is a most important axiom. In fact, this is a fundamental axiom. They do not consider themselves as a Hindu or Muslim, Indian or Pakistani. For them, all living beings are Brahman. And, and ne they never think to harm anybody. They have compassion for all. Concept of space is essential in every aspect of life we use. You know, space like space of army, space of strength. And we don't, even though we do not understand it properly, but we use it. So Bhagavad Gita also starts with the verse, it says the dharma shetra kuru shetra. Shetra means space. For implementation of any logic, it is essential to specify its space and with the help of axioms. Ancient Indian wisdom also has a very similar structure. According to Upanishad, uh, oh, I should repeat it, sorry. So what is Brahman? This is a very difficult question because Brahman is a, has an infinite dimension. Lord says, uh, Bhagavad Gita says, only Lord understand himself by his, in, his internal potency. We cannot understand or realize the Brahman because our own nature, 
our own desires, our own lust, our own greed, our own envious nature. All this abstracts in realizing the Brahman concept. So the method of realizing Brahman is association with great sannyasis, those who have realized. And then you can verify it with the help of scriptures. So Brahman space is divided into sub two sub spaces, apara and para, where superior energy or para is a living being exploiting the inferior energy that is apara. It's like earth, water, this is apara. The intersection of two spaces, para and apara, uh, para and prakriti forms a living being. This is what written in the Bhagavad Gita. Prakriti is further divided in sattvic, tamasic, rajasic. Okay, and Bhagavad Gita says that it's important to understand Prakriti Purusha and Godhead. Now, to apply mathematical logic on a domain such as physics, economics, you know, we apply all these things, and we try to understand the phenomena. Some of the uh, Phenomena which are pure mathematical is like Heisenberg principle, uncertainty principle, and the DNA structure, which use the knot theory. So I have also tried to apply the concept of mathematics because I am a wavelet person. So I see that this evolution system, you know, like for example, evolution means according to your scriptures. Initially, I was some very small species, maybe a mosquito or flies, then become a goat, maybe some trees sorry, monkeys, and then now I've become evolved to human being. So I use this concept in the wavelet, sorry, wavelets. So wavelet means initially you have something, then you add on some uh, prakriti, another space, then you add on some prakriti, another space from another space, and then, and then you are evolving, and at present you are in this space. So it's like, mathematically I want to represent like this. And the evolution of human being, you know, it's not Darwin's concept. The scripture's concepts are different. Evolution is different. Monkey has not evolved to human being. Means I was a monkey, now I have become a human being. And what I will become in the next life, it depends on my desires. <clears throat> then there is another uh, uh, interesting thing which Bhagavad Gita expresses. Mind, intelligence and ego, <clears throat> which I compare with the single degree vibration system where you have a mass damper in a spring. Mass I consider as something like anchor or ego. Damper is like uh, buddhi or intelligence in a spring is man or mind. <clears throat> so when something hits on your ego or mass, then you start acting. You, know, you start some energy. When your ego is hurt, then you start reacting and then that gives the uh, energy and that energy is transformed this body is a machine is transformed to some action this is what i so another pro thing which i want to emphasize is that so far we are doing experiment mainly with the non living objects and we are very happy with that you know? for example when you make the pendulum Right. And pendulum behaves very nicely as per your expectations or whatever. So they are non-living objects. We are getting very good results. But when you see the other field like living, medical science, psychology, etc., you are not getting very good results. <clears throat> and in the case of spiritual science, what we believe that we are going to deal with the higher living beings. They are not our subordinates. So we cannot expect that these subordinates will behave like a pendulum. If I uh, hang it and then move it so they will keep on moving. They are, our, they are higher uh, living beings. We have to follow their instructions. So that is written in the <coughs> Bhagavad Gita. Now, my question is, can we understand everything using existing mathematical spaces or mathematics. So I use this chart.